I was thinking as a psychologist that we may have uh, been trapped in some kind of end mill. Sometimes they get lost and then they start to follow each other and then the, the first one is going to go in circles and then they're going in circles forever actually mm -hmm. until they um, exhaust themselves and die. Mm -hmm. I sometimes feel that as a society it can cut, mm -hmm. uh, Caught up, being caught up in these bad decision-making cycles. Yeah, well, it's it's interesting to think about how something like that might be accelerated biologically by interconnectivity and the net. We do an extremely bad job of regulating narcissism online. Mm -hmm. There's no punishment for it. Mm -hmm. Then you just divide the comment sections like real human beings here, mm -hmm. demonic trolls and <laughs> bots here in hell, right <laughs> underneath. If your platform gets completely r overrun by demonic trolls, which is probably almost the case now with Twitter, mm -hmm. it's just going to collapse because then it's a non-playable game, right? right? It's not. There's not enough reciprocity for anyone to want to be on the platform. <laughs> Professor, Professor Schippers, may I ask you some questions? Yes, of course. What do you want to know, Rico? Oh, it's good to see you again. Jordan. Good to see you again. And we worked together, of course, for a while. And uh, yeah. for I've, what about five years? Yeah, for about five years, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, so I noticed that you were speaking out on what's going on in the world, and um, I was thinking, as a psychologist, that we may have uh, been trapped in some kind of end mill. And yeah, you uh, mentioned that earlier, the ant mill, that's a, that's a, you, you need to elaborate on that, that's a very funny idea, in yeah. a horrible way. Yeah, I think we need to, so uh, people, I, I've studied decision making for quite a while, and I see that people get sometimes stuck in decision making, and they keep on making the same decision over and over again. So with the ants, it's army ants actually, and they sometimes get caught up also because they follow each other, then they sneak up upon a prey, they eat this prey together, or, you know, bring it back to the nest or something. But sometimes they get lost and then they start to follow each other and then the, the first one is going to go in circles and then they're going in circles forever actually mm -hmm. until they um, exhaust themselves and die. Mm -hmm. so, so a whole bunch of uh, just big huge ones have been uh, uh, observed and they push out sometimes the dead ends and they keep on walking until they're all exhausted. Mm -hmm. So that's the bad news and I sometimes feel that as a society, as a person, individual, as a team mm -hmm. or as a company, but even as society, we can cut, mm. uh, cut up, being caught up in these bad decision-making cycles. Yeah, well, it's, an, it's interesting to think about how something like that might be accelerated biologically by interconnectivity and the net, mm. right? Because we're, that's partly why things are speeding up so much, is because whatever the underlying dynamics of human society are, they're happening way faster than they ever have happened. Yes. And a huge part of that's connectivity. And mm -hmm. we actually don't know what the optimal level of connectivity is. People are starting to model that with neural nets. Mm -hmm. You can have a system that's underconnected and it isn't very effective, but you can have a system that's overconnected and then it's not very effective. Mm -hmm. And it has something to do with this principle of subsidiarity, which is the right antidote to that, which is that at, in a complex hierarchical network, things have to be networked at each level, not too much or too little, or, mm -hmm. or there's catastrophe on both sides. Mm -hmm. And we really don't know. Like, we know that ec psychogenic epidemics can spread with unparalleled speed now, mm -hmm. right? And one after the other in some sense. I mean, this whole gender dysphoria issue is a great example of that. Mm -hmm. And so we don't know to what degree this increased connectivity is I think that's funny as putting us in the ant mill In the ant mill, and it's, it's, it's called a, a, dead, um, a dead spiral, dead actually. Dead spiral, yeah. Um, and it's been used in management as well. But the first thing that happens is that there is a suppression of information. Um, there is a micromanagement. Uh, there is, so all these things that we tend to see now, dysfunctional behavior of people, people uh, being uh, learned helplessness mm -hmm. is, is one of the endpoints. People don't know what to do anymore because their information is suppressed, their own opinions are not allowed anymore. Mm -hmm. There's one narrative that needs to be followed. Or else. Or else, yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, that's fun to see that emerge. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and it is, and, and the, the or else is lie or else. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's very bad. Or at and least uh, be with us, because it's, you know... Yeah, but it doesn't take long before to get from 
be with us, to lie for us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's a very, that's a very, uh, well. It's interesting because one of the things that um, uh, Rose, uh, Rose Moskanter, I think her name, Rosabeth Moskanter, she studied it. And she said, you know, people have to be uh, uh, in collective denial also about this. Yeah. So uh, the, the ants are running around and they're saying, well, we are going forward. Yeah, they are going forward, but in a circle. Mm -hmm. And so that's in a company, they keep on taking one bad decision after another. Yeah, well, that denial, you know, there's a Freudian element to that. And I don't think that denial is exactly the right diagnosis. Mm -hmm. It's more like willful blindness. Mm -hmm. And willful blindness is easier because to deny, you have to know what's going on. Mm -hmm. Then you have to generate a counter theory. Mm -hmm. Then you have to use the counter theory to suppress what you know. Mm -hmm. With willful blindness, you can just not know, mm -hmm. right? You, you get an, an emotional intimation that something's not right. Yes. And that's a call to explore. Mm -hmm. But then you can just fail to heed the call mm -hmm. and you keep yourself in a state of ignorance. And yes. that's, that's that the, the idea that that's a deadly threat to social order, that willful blindness, that goes back all the way to the ancient Egyptians. Oh, wow. So there, well, Osiris was the ancient Egyptian god of the state. Mm -hmm. And he was portrayed as a positive hero who established the healthy state. Mm -hmm. Now, he had an evil brother, Set. Mm -hmm. And Set turns into Satan through the Coptic Christians. Mm -hmm. And Set was always conspiring to take out the rightful king. Mm -hmm. And Osiris's sins were twofold. He was outdated, so he's old, mm -hmm. but he was also willfully blind. Mm -hmm. He could have seen what his brother was up to, but mm -hmm. he chose not to. Mm -hmm. And then Set chops him into pieces, mm -hmm. so everything falls apart, okay. and then he dominates the state. Mm -hmm. And then the antidote to that, as far as the Egyptians were concerned, was Horus. And Horus is the Egyptian eye mm -hmm. and the falcon. Mm -hmm. And so the antidote to willful blindness is voluntary attention. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Egyptians had figured that out in their mythology like 5,000 years ago. Yeah, they didn't understand it explicitly in some mm -hmm. sense, mm -hmm. but they knew that that eagle eye, that falcon eye, because mm -hmm. falcons can really see, mm -hmm. was the, and that's the Egyptian eye as well. It's also the overview, right? Yeah, so that's right. From it's a distance. A, you what? bet, from above, yeah. but, but high resolution from above, mm -hmm. right? And so, yeah, so Horus is a youthful god, and he... He grows up outside the state, in some sense alienated from it. Mm -hmm. But he, he differs from his father, Osiris, in that he can see. Mm -hmm. Now, um, he goes back to Egypt and has a terrible battle with Seth and mm -hmm. defeats him, although he loses an eye in the process. So mm -hmm. the story there is that the terrible power that constantly threatens the state is so malevolent that I even if you pay careful attention to it, it can still damage you. Mm -hmm. But he, he overcomes Seth and banishes him. Mm -hmm. But then he, he takes his eye, instead of putting it back in his head and becoming king, he doesn't do that. He goes to the underworld mm -hmm. where his father, Osiris, is languishing, sort of in a half-alive state. Mm -hmm. So it's, And he gives his father the eye, mm -hmm. and then they unite. Wow. And the symbol for pharaonic sovereignty was the union of Osiris and Horus. Mm. And so it's the, it's the proper tradition given sight by the living is the antidote to the power that disintegrates the state. Wow. It's amazing. It's amazing. And, and how it's can amazing. we use this knowledge today, for instance? What, what, what can we do? Because, yeah, both of, uh, I think both of us have been trying to get people out of the end yeah. mill. Uh, we at least ourselves stepped aside, I well, think. Well, you least know, I did. our work has been on... so. Michaela and I worked on uh, a project that we now have a website for, selfauthoring.com, for, on the future authoring program, and we got people to develop their vision, yeah. right? A vision uh, of the ideal future. Yeah, exactly. So it's a visionary en e yes. exercise. And so one of the things you do with people to enhance their vision and to stave off the degeneration of the state is for them to develop a positive vision going forward because we're visionary creatures and exactly. you could say well how does that work socially it's like well it works psychologically and it works socially so mm -hmm. if you have a positive vision of the future you can revitalize your own tyrannical self and mm -hmm. stave off nihilism and despair and all of that and then if you get good at implementing that and you start to think let's say on a broader scale then mm -hmm you can start moving beyond your own personal concerns which is where you should start and maybe start acting in a manner that helps you restore beneficial order yep. to restore beneficial order 
to the state itself. Mm -hmm. But it starts with the individual, right, fundamentally. Right, right. Yeah, because I feel that uh, I, I feel that many people are in a kind of survival mode. They can't really see any further than the next day or something or the next yeah. month. But yeah. if you do, uh, so I devised, uh, based on the self-authoring, I devised Letters to the Future. Yeah. And in the Letters to the Future, people think about the ideal world if there were n no constraints at all, versus the world that will come to pass if they go on like this. Yeah. And they devise a plan for themselves, a very concrete plan. What can I contribute today or yeah. tomorrow? Or So if people start writing today, they can make changes tomorrow. Yeah. Right. We can, or yeah. even today. Or e today is even yeah, better. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, they're at the, your show now. <laughs> yeah. Well, one of the things you do as a behavior therapist is help people lay out. Well, you lay out the problem first. What What's wrong with your life? Why are you suffering unduly? And then you lay out something approximating um, an an alternative to that. Like mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you're miserable. What's the nature of the misery precisely? You can do a multi-dimensional analysis. Maybe you don't have an intimate relationship. We did this with the past authoring exercises. Mm -hmm. you don't have an intimate relationship. You don't have any friends. You don't have a job or a career. You're not educated the way you should be. You're not taking care of yourself mentally and physically. You don't use your time outside of work well, etc. Those are all domains where you might be lacking. And then you can think of, well, what could you have if that was optimized? The future authoring exactly. program does that. And yeah. And then what concrete, implementable, incremental steps could you take to realize that? And mm -hmm. that works just fine. And mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the thing that's cool about that too is, you know, if people are desperate, they think, well, everything in my life is broken. I'm so low, I can't even look at my circumstance without terror. Mm -hmm. And I'll never get out of this. Mm -hmm. So that would be true in some sense if improvement was linear exactly. but it's not it tends to Go rise that. exponentially yeah, it, it, once you get going it starts with the first step yeah. that's what i've noticed a very yeah. small first yeah. step yeah. yeah well it has to be so the rule for the first step is something like is there something you know that you should do that you that you could do mm -hmm. that you would do mm -hmm. and that's often a demoralizing exercise in some sense to think that through because you think well you know, here's a radical change I need to make in my life, but there's no way I'm going to do that. But maybe I take a tiny step. And then you have to ask yourself, well, how, given how useless I am, how tiny a step would it have to be? And then the answer is, well, I've tried lots of times in the past and failed, so it needs to be a smaller step. And then you get to the point where you think, oh my God, that's the biggest step I can take. And often the answer is yes, if you'll do it, maybe it's a tiny step forward. It's an embarrassing step forward. Mm -hmm. But it if you step. take it, it's, you're in a slightly better place. You know, mm -hmm. I had clients whose lives were terribly messed up, both internally and externally. So, mm -hmm. for example, the rooms, maybe they were adults who should have left home long ago. And the rooms were just a catastrophic mess. The bedrooms they lived in, and they're still in their parents' house. And we'd start by getting them to clean up like one corner of one drawer in their bureau. Mm -hmm. And so embarrassing. I, I should start doing that as well. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, well, it is a really useful exercise. If you find that there's something around you that's out of order and you won't put it in order, then you have to, because it's daunting, mm -hmm. then you have to decrease the, the demand mm -hmm. you place on yourself. So one of the things I do with my office, for example, if it gets into a mess, is I'll, every time I go into my office, I'll clean up two things. Yeah. And then, because all you have to do is clean up slightly faster than you make a mess and everything <laughs> falls into order. Yeah. And so you can bargain with yourself, you know, you can mm -hmm. find out what step you're actually willing to take. Now, mm -hmm. it's a terrifying thing because you do reveal to yourself your own weakness, right? Because you think, well, I can just leap forward on that front. It's like, yeah. well, you haven't for 20 years. Yeah. So. They want to go too fast. Yeah, so, they want to bite off more than they can chew. Exactly. Um, so what would you advise to people who want to contribute to society these days? Because lo uh, I've been approached by lots of people that say, I don't really know what to do. Uh, I'd say I start by putting your own house in order. <laughs> I really mean that. It's like, who th if your if you're day-to-day routines are not put together in a way that's productive and generous, you haven't regulated your intimate relationships, your friendships and so forth, 
you're not really in any position to be thinking about what you can do for the broader community because you just don't know enough, mm -hmm. you know, and, and of, so... Of course, but you're of course a clinical psychologist, but yeah. I talk to people who have the house in order. They want yeah. to really contribute to society, but they say this, it's so big what's going on at the moment. Like in society, the government's yeah. making all the decisions, so there's this... Well, there's happiness. lots of things people can do on that front that are concrete. You could join a political party. Mm -hmm. and volunteer you could join a businessman's club you could mm -hmm. join a sports club like do something social yeah. on the social front and offer your services and then mm -hmm. go there and see what needs to be done and start doing it if, if you do that in a political party mm -hmm. if you're young and you're useful mm -hmm. opportunities will open up to you so fast you can't even believe it because right. every political party and almost all say businessmen's clubs and that sort of thing mm -hmm. they're just dying for membership Mm -hmm. And people have abandoned their... Or go to a church. Well, I don't believe in God. It's like and the church is messed up. It's like, hey, there's some opportunity for you. Go, you could go church try to be of service there and see if you could do something useful. And that's mm -hmm. part of resurrecting your dead father, you know. And so the fact that it's troublesome and difficult is like, well, you wanted to do something about something troublesome and difficult. So yeah. there it is ahead of you. And so people have abandoned their civic responsibility. And so... What happens is that you get fragmentary individuals, mm -hmm. no intermediary civic groups, mm -hmm. and a tyrant. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a complete bloody catastrophe. And <laughs> one of the only things you can do about that is start to operate at maybe one level beyond where you are. And, mm -hmm. you know, one of the things you see in Canada, for example, is that the school boards are dementedly ideologically possessed. Mm -hmm. Well, why? Well, because reasonable people don't take the responsibility of running for it's an elected position, for a school board sure. position. And so yeah. who do you get in there? You get demented, resentful activists <laughs> who have nothing better to do than cause trouble. And then you think, why are these institutions so much trouble? And the answer is, well, the reasonable people have decided that... Now, it's more complex because sometimes the reasonable people also have... Their hands full in some sense, right? Because mm -hmm. they're already doing productive things. But it doesn't matter because if you let the least able and most resentful occupy all the intermediary administrative positions, then mm -hmm. then you have tyranny emerging at all those levels. Mm -hmm. And so a huge part of what people need to do, and this is particularly true of young people, is they have to reacquaint themselves with civic responsibility. And they can't let, what would you call that? a too premature cynicism stop them. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, mm -hmm. things are broken. They've always been broken. Mm -hmm. It's like it's up to you to Do something. knit them back together. Well, what I say, write your letter to the future, then you'll yeah. find out what your contribution yeah. can be because it has to be something that energizes you because otherwise, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, if I don't get energy from something, I'm... Yeah, well, that's, that's a marker, right? Mm -hmm. It's a marker. You wouldn't get energy from it unless it was right for you in some sense. Mm -hmm. The other thing you can look at, you think, well... This really bugs me. It's mm -hmm. like, okay, think about that. There's an infinite number of things in principle that could bug you because there's just no shortage of problems, right? There's an <laughs> infinite number of problems. But some problems pick you mm -hmm. and they bug you. It's like, mm -hmm. yeah, well, that's, that's your destiny calling. Mm -hmm. What bugs you is your destiny calling. That mm -hmm. is what it is. True. And you might think, well, that's really annoying. It's like, well, it won't let you go, right? Mm -hmm. And it's very strange because there's a concordance then between your psyche and the and the world. Mm -hmm. And part of that concordance can be found in that positive adventure that you describe. Mm -hmm. But part of it can be found in the fact that you get gripped. It's mm -hmm. like, I just can't stop thinking about this. It's like, hey man, that's your problem. Mm -hmm. Now why? Who knows? Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean just because it grips you that you know what to do about it. Mm -hmm. But the fact that it grips you, mm -hmm. that's a genuine phenomenological, true, true. Uh, what would you say? It, uh, experience it's yeah. real yes what i usually do i start talking to people because they kind of reflect it back to me and then uh, one person says this one person says this and so we get all kinds of pieces of information and then i think okay this is the problem and now yeah I well handle. one of the things i've noticed as i've talked to good or great leaders around the world is that one of the defining hallmarks of a great leader is that they go around listen and aggregate problems <laughs> so if you go out and door knock as a political figure, yeah. which is a hard thing to do because mm -hmm. people are, some are welcoming and some aren't, and mm -hmm. you deal with a huge variety of people. It's quite intimidating. That's something you do as a volunteer, let's say, 
if you decided to join a political party, you go door knock and your, your job isn't to sell the party platform to the person that you're talking to. Your mm -hmm. job is to listen to what their problems are. Yes. And then maybe your party might have something to offer, but the fundamental issue is to listen. Mm -hmm. What are the problems? So you listen to 100 people and then you can aggregate the problem mm -hmm. and think, okay, got the diagnosis, mm -hmm. right? From the horse's mouth, I got the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Okay, now then you can think, well, there's the diagnosis. Here's an array of possible solutions. Mm -hmm. And then you can talk to people about the problem and you can say, well, here's some things we could do. And then you can see mm -hmm. how people are responding to that. Maybe they go, oh my God, I never thought of that. That's a great solution. I'd be happy to help you with that. It's like, okay, that's a pretty good solution. Yeah. And, and that definitely works. I mean, I've had lots of experiences in my life where I diagnosed something, let's say, and then start. Good evening. The show will start soon. <laughs> Please go to your seat. T ten minutes is uh, the, yeah. So, so you can tell if you've got a solution that's credible. And this is good for people who are in sales to know too. If you're a salesman, you go to a company, you say, well, what, what problems are you having? And you don't sell, because selling requires force. You say, what problems are you having? Mm -hmm. And then they tell you. And then you think, well, do I have anything that would help them solve that problem? And if the answer is no, you should probably just go somewhere else, because mm -hmm. you're not going to make the sale. Exactly. But if Maybe they lay out their problems and then they're pretty happy with you because you listened. Mm -hmm. And so then they trust you, especially if you're listening without being instrumental and manipulative about it. Mm -hmm. And then you see, well, you have a problem and we have a solution. Now, if the problem and the solution don't match, we then, have... well, you should go somewhere else because exactly. you're not going to sell anything anyways. But actually, one of the things I think we lack is that we shouldn't we should try to create win-win situations yes definitely and that's exactly what you're now describing uh, yeah yeah and listening to each other is a is a first step but second is okay how can we make each other yeah. stronger yeah well that so sometimes people think that within the confines of a marriage that what you're doing is continually compromising and that's what you should be doing but mm. that's not right no. so if you have a problem mm -hmm we're married, you have a problem and I have a problem, then mm -hmm. I could hear your problem mm -hmm. and you could hear mine and then we could put our heads together and we could think, okay, is there a way we could formulate a joint solution mm -hmm. that would be better than any solution that either of us could do alone, which mm -hmm. is kind of what the marriage is, you know, <laughs> and you can almost always do that if you mm -hmm. open yourself up to it. You think, yes. well, is there a way that you can get what you need and want and me too, mm -hmm. but in a better way than we'd get separately? And that is the basis for the best kind of relationship moving forward intimately but also with friends certainly with business partners because the other thing is is that if your interests are aligned with your business partners in this fundamental way mm -hmm. it's like you're going for what you need and want and so am i we don't even have to monitor each other no. it's like i can just say well especially if i also believe that you're competent and trustworthy and if i don't then why would i be doing this mm -hmm. but then i can think well you can just go off and do your own thing because you'll bring your talents to bear on the problem mm -hmm. and they'll be different than my talents mm -hmm. and we'll definitely get a synergy out of that exactly. and those are you know you think if you're thinking about starting a business enterprise and you think that what you do when you make a sale is get the better of the other person you're a bloody fool because mm -hmm. first of all they will figure that out and they will take their revenge that's for sure you don't, it, that's not a sustainable relationship. Exactly. It forces you to be psychopathic and narcissistic and mm -hmm. exploitative, and then you train yourself to do that. And if you think that's the route to business success, then, well, then you're a fool and a, and a manipulative and exploitative fool at that. It's just, mm -hmm. that is not how the world works. Exactly. Yeah, so. Well, let's go for the win-win situation. Yes, then. definitely, definitely. Mutual enthusiasm. That's, that's, yeah, you, what I try to do with people that I negotiate with when I negotiate with them about anything is, I would like you to walk away from this negotiation thrilled. That would be perfect if we could pull that off. It's like, yes, I want to do this. It's like, nah, not you forced me into a corner and I have to submit. Like you don't get willing partners that way. Exactly, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's a short-term solution, but uh, yeah. it won't work. In yeah, it's moment. a short-term solution dependent on force. Mm -hmm. Well. Great. If you want to bring lawyers into it and, you know, castigate your business partners into compliance with your demands, like, go for it. See what sort of life you have. That's just misery. Yes. You know, so, and that's, 
part of the problem with the leftist insistence, for example, that there's no, there's nothing but power. Mm -hmm. It's like that's it. You could hardly formulate a statement less true than that. Mm -hmm. There's power when things fall apart. Mm -hmm. but yeah, I feel that in the last couple of years, or actually maybe the couple, maybe even centuries, people with Machiavellianism, yeah. narcissism, and psychopathy yeah. have driven to the top. And yeah. now we, yeah, yeah, we're in an we, epidemic of narcissism. Yeah, yeah, definitely. and I think maybe part of that is because we do an extremely bad job of regulating narcissism online. Mm -hmm. There's no punishment for it. No. So I read, for example, I found all sorts of markers on YouTube for narcissism in mm -hmm. the comments section. Mm -hmm. So I can tell you a bunch of them. Okay. Um, anonymous name, mm -hmm. an anonymous demonic name. Mm -hmm. That's a really good marker. Okay. Um, use of bro or bra or dude or casual use of a first name or derisive humor or the use of LOL, laugh out loud, or mm -hmm. LMFAO, which is laugh my fucking ass off. Okay. And so any derisive, contemptuous humor mm -hmm. combined with anonymity and this casual use of familiarity, plus, okay. an, yeah, it's like troll demons. Okay. It's terrible. And those are the people who will say things that would absolutely, instantly get them punched if they ever said them to someone in person. Okay. And so they're completely uncontrolled. Okay. And mm -hmm. the social media companies either don't regulate them, mm -hmm. even though they could, because, for example, all you'd have to do in the comments section is separate the real people from the demon trolls, mm -hmm. and that would control 90% of pathological activity. So imagine on YouTube, for example, you have to validate your identity like you do on Twitter if you get a blue check. Mm -hmm. Then you just divide the comment sections. Like, Real human beings here, mm -hmm. demonic trolls and bots <laughs> here in hell, right? <laughs> Underneath the action. Now, if you want to go read the demonic troll comments, no, no. problem. Yeah, it would but be nice. it'd be better just to stay with the real people. And because those people are, are enabled, the social media companies capitalize on the, no, on the what would you call it, the, the aggressiveness and mm -hmm. yeah. that they... The more they bold the statements are, the better it's yeah, it attracts, more views. It's a cheap way of attracting attention. Mm -hmm. And so I think of that as, imagine that you could run a factory and produce something and pollute like mad, mm -hmm. right? Externalized cost. Mm -hmm. Well, social media companies, mm -hmm. their externalized pollution is social, mm -hmm. right? It's the virtual equivalent of pollution. Mm -hmm. They pay zero price for it. Mm -hmm. Well, so far, yeah. you know, they'll pay for it because if... If your platform gets completely r overrun by demonic trolls, which is probably almost the case now with Twitter, mm -hmm. it's just going to collapse because then it's a non-playable game, right? right? It's not. There's not enough reciprocity for anyone to want to be on the platform, mm -hmm. and that hasn't happened yet to Twitter. But, but, mm -hmm. but, it, it probably will. Well, it looks to me like. Yeah. It looks to me like it's tilting in that direction more all the time. Well, especially since a lot of people are thrown off uh, Twitter, but these are scientists, people who have a different narrative yeah, than the yeah. official narrative. Well, well, that's another, that's another problem. Sure, but sure, definitely. Mm -hmm. Well, that also means that fair players who are antagonistic, mm -hmm. let's say, mm -hmm. get eliminated from the game. Well, if you mm -hmm. do that enough, you just eliminate everybody who plays fair because mm -hmm. as the system gets more and more pathological, it takes less and less truth to be defined as a troublemaker. Mm -hmm. Then you just have nothing but troll demons. And I do think they're demons. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is why. Because you might think a troll on Twitter is a human being. It's like, no, it's not. The person who originated the thought was a human being, in some sense, under the grip of a system of pathological ideas. But as soon as they transform themselves into an electronic avatar, and there's millions of copies of them, mm -hmm. they're not human anymore, mm -hmm. right? They're whatever the hell well, you are text, when you're virtualized. You're seeing, yeah. Well, right, but it's, but it's, it's, it's not just text because it's replicated everywhere, yeah, yeah. right? So it's, it's something we don't well, understand. It's a virus, yeah, it's a, that's right. That's right. Well, it's got a viral element. There's, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. It's got a viral... It's got an infectious and viral element, and mm -hmm. it infects people with rage. Mm -hmm. And that's actually the provocation, because the comments are so derisive, mm -hmm. they're, and they're enraging. Mm -hmm. and, and, well, and the social media capital, companies capitalize on the rage, mm -hmm. and then they raise the temperature of the whole society. Yes. And God only knows, you know, is that fatal? 
don't we know. don't know. Can we, can we throw some water on it? Uh, it cools down. Let's 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 do that in our ne next talk and talk yeah. about this. It's well, really yeah, funny. yeah. Well, it's very true. I think some of the platforms. I don't know if. I had. I had a very ambivalent relationship with Twitter. Mm -hmm. I wanted to use it because I wanted to understand it, you know, but it's very difficult to stay civil and use Twitter. Mm -hmm. Now, I think partly because the, the small text length of Twitter mm -hmm. means that any communication about an important topic should not occur on Twitter. Mm -hmm. But we don't know, right? Because we don't know the psychological rules for communicating with people when you only have a limited character set. No one has any idea, mm -hmm. especially when it's virtualized and abstracted. Sure, sure. But it looks to me like you can't discuss anything serious on Twitter mm -hmm. without it degenerating. Right. So, right. Well, let's uh, see how we can fix that next time. And uh, your show is on now. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, thank you for this. You bet. Uh, nice great. to talk to you again. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Thank you. You bet.